So it looks like we have everyone here and online with us now. Um, so we will get this uh, session started. So here we have um, our side event uh, on corporate renewable energy procurement um, with RE100. Um, this session also has live interpretation. Um, so if you require from English to Chinese or vice versa, you can follow uh, the audio for the session in the interpretation stream and we'll post that shortly in the session chat here. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Alicia Li, uh, who is RE100 representative uh, in Taiwan for the uh, Shanghai uh, Institution for Economic Research. Uh, so I'll hand it over now to Alicia to kick off this session. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, I wasn't sure if we wanted to do the presentation first, Helen, or would you like us to kick off with the round table? Um, I, I'm i very happy with whatever we ran, um, whatever works, and it could be good to provide a bit of context before we jump into the conversation. Um, um, yeah, I, I agree. And I think the original agenda had uh, you presenting first, so if you're still open to that, you can take it away. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, well, um, the next, um, <laughs> the next fun thing to, to check would be um, whether everyone can see this. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm always worried. Um, <laughs> yes. I'm, yeah, I've, I've, been, I've been a bit scarred this year by technology, <laughs> as you can see from today. But, um, but great, that's 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 brilliant. Um, so I, I thought it would be useful to give a bit of background um, today before I start on where um, where I sit within BNF and, and more broadly what BNF does. Um, so we have a, a range of um, sustainability research um, that that we um, put out and more broadly cover the energy transition. And where I sit within this is the um, the, the sort of the transition opportunities and what um, what companies can do to, to be involved with this. So a large part of this is um, how they power, make, move and supply goods. Um, today we'll obviously be focusing on clean energy buying, but I think it is important to see this within the broader picture of, of the low energy, trans low carbon energy transition. Um, and to and to sort of see how this fits into to broader goals that company might companies might set. Um, some some of the things we do are um, and if you can see this box over here um, is the the corporate energy market outlook. Um, we we cover sustainable finance and PPAs specifically, um, which I will touch on today as well, and um, and also more recently how. COVID-19 has hit some of these um, some of these objectives that companies are setting. Um, so um, another slide just very quickly before we begin um, the content is, is a look at what some of the data that we have looks like. Um, so we have a variety of tools that you can toggle to suit your own um, your own data needs and um, and they're, um, they're actually shown down here. So um, an example is shown here where you can filter for, for different signing years, offtake types, um, countries and sectors to, to see how the PPA market, for example, is, is developing and, um, and to see the different, um, different trends that are emerging uh, and according to the areas that you cover that, that you're interested in. Um, so, what does what does this look? What does some of the output of this look like? Um, I thought it would be useful to, to as a start, to just have an overview of um, what uh, what some of the RE100 members are up to <laughs> once they've signed their pledges, and um, what what a lot of the more ambitious companies are now doing is, is signing these. Global corporate PPAs, um, which is the, the fixed term 
uh, no, sorry, fixed price long term power agreements um, to, to sign to clean energy. And as you can see here, the trend is very much going upwards um, year on year. Since 2016, we've seen nothing but growth and this year actually is on track to hit an, an, another record. We didn't actually think it would because last year um, it was there was a huge um, huge volume signed by Google in September. We had 1. Um, 1. 1.6 gigawatts announced of clean clean power agreements. Um, but this September we've had um, we've had a similar uh, enormous deal announced again by Total, 3.3 um, gigawatts signed for a so solar portfolio in Spain. So actually, this year it once again is on track um, and 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 set to set to pace ahead of the of the last year. Um, just when we thought another record couldn't be set. Um, and if we look at um, I think it's useful to break this activity down by region, um, just to, to see the nuances within it. Um, so if we, if we look at the US, which is the main market at the moment for these deals, um, although I think OPAC has a huge potential, um, it's actually, it's had a less successful year so far. So um, a, a lot of this is due to um, actually the effects of COVID, it's, it's been, um, worse affected than a lot of other regions and that's because of the power price hit that it's taken um, due to decreased demand. Um, say for example Texas which is traditionally one of the, the biggest areas for, um, for for these clean energy announcements um, is, is, is seen its volumes um, actually um, at 20 percent of what they were last year um, so that state alone um, which was driving quite a lot of the activity and the momentum um, has has taken a real um, nosedive and as a result I think the US is probably the only re region that we cover um, that, that will actually um, see a downturn and I can go into more reasons on this um, in the questions, if, if anyone wants to discuss some of the COVID related impacts that have, that have been seen there. Um, on a more positive note, um, in, in APAC, um, we are now seeing um, a slow improvement in the number of um, procurement options, clean energy procurement options for uh, companies. So RE100 members that are located in APAC now, um, now face you know, PPAs aside, they, they can, um, they have more retail choice, they can sign renewable energy certificates, that's what REC stands for. Um, th th there's a lot of net metering that is available now, so that's, um, that's clean electricity that is on site, um, that is, that is so-called behind the meter, um, that is, um, that's quite accessible for, for example, companies with with a large roof space where they might want to put solar panels. On-site PPAs and off-site PPAs are now um, actually legal in a lot more countries than there were. Um, I, I should probably have put this table alongside what it looked like this time two years ago, but it, it, there were a lot more greyed out boxes saying no. Um, there just wasn't really enough space on one slide, but um, but it's it's definitely um, an improving trajectory, and um, and I, I think the um, the progress being made is is definitely in the right direction overall. Um, and if we look at one country in particular that's doing really well, um, South Korea, um, and, and in particular with respect to RE100 um, members, which is the focus of today today's discussion. Um, it's South Korea has been really exemplary in paving the way for RE100 program and um, RE100 members with its, and it has this pilot program um, for renewable energy certificates that is proving really popular and is actually already taking off um, in in quite a positive way. Um, so so now if you are a um, a corporate who is based in South Korea or not even headquartered there, but just some operations are based in the country. And um, you have these four options um, to actually 
make progress on your RE100 commitment. So yeah, either either a green tariff investment um, on-site generation or PPA option is available to you. Um, and this is a really nice example of um, a market that has, you know, where policy has been a really important driver of unlocking this this new corporate demand. Um, and there's absolutely no reason why other other markets can't follow as well. Um, and yeah, and, and and in terms of the demand um, in that we see in APAC, it's looking really strong. So there are now over fifty RE one hundred members based in Asia. Um, when I say based in, I should say um, with their headquarters um, in, in the APAC region. And um, these are just a, a selected highlight of of that um, demand group, but. Um, I, I expect I expect it to grow, and what we what we tend to see, which is quite interesting, is companies looking at what their peer group are doing um, and saying, "Okay, look, um, our, our top five competitors in this market have have all signed up to RE100. What are we doing? Um, we we need to get on board. We need to follow suit and, and do the same." So, I think it's really good to see some of these industry leaders. Um, doing so and um and later as well we'll see how the, the sort of trickle down effect it can also be um be evident in their supply chains um i've got i've got a chart to show that at the end um just to turn um turn back as well to the, to the more regional outlook um covering europe um specifically um so i think Europe is an important. Um, Europe has an important influence on what happens in APAC. Um, again, because of the supply chain link, um, because a lot of the European companies have um, that have covered their their renewable energy needs in that continent because it's much easier to to see, to find um, PPAs and clean energy access in in, in Europe. And at the moment um, are now looking further afield and quite often are looking to cover their um, their operations in um, in the APAC region. So it's, it's really important to have an eye on what's going on everywhere. Um, and the good news is, is that it's, it's having another record year and th this PPA chart, and um, we've, we've seen it for um, the US and globally as well, um, but I think it's, it's, it's a really good, um, signpost towards the general trend that this this demand in this region is also going up and that will have a corresponding knock-on effect in APAC. Um, so a lot of this has been bolstered by Total's three gigawatt PPA announcement but, um, but generally um, a healthy spread of um, of demand in terms both in terms of geographical diversity so more and more company and um, and countries are opening up and also the mix of companies that are signing up to these deals as well. Um, and so specifically looking at Europe again, um, we we have this chart, um, which I'll show again later for global demand, but what I thought was interesting to show was um, what, that, what the demand gap looks like still. Um, so what we've done, um, with the RE100 data is to look at all of the 260 members that there are currently and map out how those members are currently sourcing their clean power. Um, and the legend on the right, you can see there's certificate purchases, on-site generation, some off-site solar and wind, those are PPAs. Um, and then we set that against what their future or projected electricity demand will be in the future. And as you can see here, by 2030, on the assumption that they actually reach their targets, um, there will be an 85 terawatt hour gap um, of energy demand. And the important thing to note is that this, this is a global view. So these are com companies that are headquartered in Europe, but a lot of that 85 terawatt hours will be demand based elsewhere and um, particularly some of the manufacturing operations in APAC. So um, th this this demand um, 
you know, as I say, a lot of it's been fulfilled already in Europe. So these companies will be looking further afield now to fulfill that um, and, and to, to close um, close that demand shortfall. Um, just a quick look at um, some of the some of the drivers in, of, of the PPA market in in Europe. Um, we we have some pricing data, which I always think is quite interesting to show because it's it's really um, you know it, it, it's a, it's a very untransparent market. And and to be honest, if you were to, you wouldn't necessarily be able to transact these prices. Um, but I think it's helpful to see the range within which prices often fall. Um, and one of the really important things that we produced from this um, from this survey was that there was a strong correlation between where lots of um, activity for PPAs is, um, is, is, is signed. And um, so, for example, for wind in the Nordic, Sweden, Norway, Finland and Denmark, and for solar in Spain. Um, so a lot of the market success that we see stems from this competitive pricing. And I think this is an important message that um, RE100 members can take over um, as well um, when, when they're looking potentially to, to sign some clean energy deals. Um, and another thing that I think is really important to emphasize is that um, it, more innovation is needed. And, this, this is a European example, um, but this can also be um, said for all regions um, globally. And um, what, what we're looking at here is um, three announcements for pan-European PPAs. And what that is, is a virtual agreement where physically the clean energy is, is generated in one country and then the certificates us are taken by the same company but to cover all of its operations in, in a range of other different locations across the continent um, and this is this is actually the primary reason that we see the US market has taken off um, the, the ability for um, US based companies to sign virtual PPAs in one state and then take the energy the clean energy credits in another um it, it's really helped the market scale and um and it's made it much easier for these companies to to do things fast and um and in large quantities so i think this is going to be a really important model that we see coming well it's already starting to come over to europe in spain um but also i think there's a lot of potential for it in in the apac region as well um just a, a quick note on demand, which also links into probably what, what a lot of the um, RE100 members are facing this year. Um, some of the boardroom conversations that they'll, they'll be having is, um, you know, how is COVID affecting our sustainability programme? And the good news is, is that we have actually seen very little impact on resolve. Um, so what we, what the message here is, is um, what we tracked a range of sustainability in indicators throughout the pandemic. So since March, we've produced monthly reports on this. Um, and I've highlighted um, PPA volumes and prices, and also most importantly for this discussion, the corporate commitments. Um, and um, yeah, so the, the, the number of commitments for both science-based targets and RE100 is above where it was last year. Um, and so that's, that's a really important message um, to get across and longer term as well. Um, we did a survey um, on over 100 um, executives from leading sustainability um, companies that, that lead in the sustainability space that have um, been very vocal about their programs or, or made very public commitments. Um, and they see post lockdown a really, a really important role that their sustainability strategy will play within the company. Um, and whilst there are sort of immediate knock on effects in terms of executive access and budget, um, actually. This is this is looking really promising in the longer term, so um, so yeah, it's um, something to bear in mind when when you're thinking about um, longer term demand impact. Um, and so this is this is again coming revisiting um, 
the chart that we saw before and, and re-emphasizing that point on on global demand increasing. Um, so we see it we see it in, in the way that people are talking about it and also this shows the, the hard the hard quantitative facts and um, backing it up. Um, you know to 2030 there will be 224 terawatt hours globally um, of, of demand shortfall. If we think back to the European graph, that was um, 85 terawatt hours. So, so this is um, yeah, it's, it's about three times as much. And um, this is the equivalent of um, around Thailand's power demand. Just to put it into context, to, to show the scale of demand that is needed. Um, and you know, if you take this and put it alongside that resolve that I was just um, talking through from sustainability um, decision makers and, and, and leading executives within these companies, it paints a really strong picture of, um, of the potential demand to come. Um, similarly, um, last, last couple of slides, um, just to corroborate this, um, this story of demand. Um, I know today we're, we're going to be focusing on the RE100 group, but I think it's really important to see this um, going back to what I said at the beginning in the context of the low carbon transition, um, that companies are more broadly trying to um, trying to adopt. And um, I think, so science-based targets are a more holistic um, look at carbon production for companies and um, whereas RE100 focuses on clean power um, science-based targets is is in and um, looks at heat emissions um, transport supply chain and as well as obviously power and and, and, and it takes a much more broad view on how companies are producing their emissions so this is really important target to see alongside RE100 membership um, and what, we, what we've done here is very similar to the RE100 charts that, I, that I've shown. Um, we've, we've aggregated all of the commitments um, and, and pushed them out to 2030 to see what that demand will look like if it is indeed offset um, and, and those emissions are reduced. And so to put this into context as well, 201 megatons of CO2 is roughly equivalent to Spain's annual emissions. So this is really significant. I mean, that's a, yeah, it's, it's a major global economy. And if the companies could actually reach their targets, that would be a significant contribution um, to, to reducing emissions. Um, and then I just wanted to end on this on this um, thought that supply chains, I, I, I really think they're an important um, source of clean energy demand that will um, that will be an important trickle down effect from RE100 commitments. And what we see here is um, where suppliers are very um, are very bound to their um, they're sort of the, the biggest contractor they have. Say you have a contract with Apple, um, that's going to be a, a really important um, customer for you. If you if you have say over thirty or forty percent of your revenue and is dependent on that contract with Apple, then whatever Apple are leading with, um, you're very likely to um, to to actually to listen. And, and if they say right, you know, we're on this clean energy and 100 percent renewable energy journey if you want to be, um, be be a loyal customer of ours um, and continue to get these um these brilliant contracts and, and work with us you need to follow what we're doing so actually looking at this um there's a lot of it sort of highlights the pressure that a lot of these bigger companies can put on their suppliers and i think the best example of this is um the deal that we saw signed in Taiwan with TSMC um, recently, back in, back in just in August this year, where nearly a gigawatt of clean power was signed for. Um, now, TSMC must get full credit for the fact that they, they already have a really impressive um, clean energy program of their own, but there's no doubt that conversations that they would have had with, with Apple, which is 
you know, they, they are one of Apple's three biggest suppliers. Um, they, they, there would have been a lot of um, pressure and influence coming, coming down as well um, from that relationship. And I think this is a this is a trend that we'll see more and more. So that's that's all I had to say today. Um, uh, and now we can open up to discussion. Great. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, that was really great and very informative. And I hope um, my presentation that's following that um, will kind of be able to narrow the scope a bit down into RE100 in Taiwan. Um, we've also kind of a little bit behind schedule, um, but I've also been told that we're allotted a few more minutes for the round table. Um, so that should be okay. So yeah, let's, oh, by the way, my, my presentation is pre-recorded, so things might look a little different. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alicia and I am the RE100 representative from Zhonghua Institution for Economic Research, or SEER. SEER is the regional delivery partner for RE100 in Taiwan, meaning that we are a point of contact between the RE100 headquarters and Taiwan. RE100 is a global renewable energy initiative led by the Climate Group in partnership with CDP in which some of the world's most influential businesses have joined the collaborative effort to reach 100% renewable power by 2050. RE100's overall mission is to respond to the science and to keep the planet from warming over 1.5 degrees Celsius. Taiwan's companies join the network of over 260 members, which together would rank 21 in the world's largest electricity consumers if all RE100 members were a country. One in three members have already reached 75% or over renewable energy usage, and 30 plus members have achieved their 100% renewable energy goal. Many RE100 members like Apple and Google have already successfully or are starting to ensure that their suppliers are also committing to 100% renewable electricity. RE100 is proof of the power of collaboration. The growing group of members adds pressure to, the policy, to policy changes that advance renewable energy development. And this of course includes Taiwan. There are currently five RE100 member companies that are headquartered in Taiwan and the order in which they joined the five companies are TCI as the first to join in 2017, Tridal, Hero Right, Grape King and TSMC. Taiwan is garnering a lot of attention as a potential up and coming region of renewable energy development, and some of this attention can be attributed to the growing number of Taiwanese RE100 members. In fact, during Climate Week last month, it was announced that TSMC tied with Iron Mountain in the award for Most Impact Pioneer at the inaugural RE100 Leadership Awards. So how can you achieve RE100? In Taiwan, there are three possible strategies available to meet our, that meet RE100's technical criteria in renewable energy procurement. The first is self-generation of renewable electricity through company-owned installations. The second is direct procurement contract or power purchase agreements, PPAs, which in Taiwan involves the buyer, the seller, and Thai power. And the third is TREX, Taiwan's bundled renewable energy certificates, which are currently most widely available for solar energy. And if you want to hear more about these strategies, we will be discussing renewable electricity procurement in Taiwan in the roundtable after this presentation. Um, so as a very basic introduction to the membership requirements, companies must first set renewable electricity goals that state what year they plan to reach 100%, as well as an intermittent goal. Companies must also provide transparent annual progress reports. So while Taiwan faces its challenges in renewable energy development and procurement, 
It is also an ex at an exciting stage with a lot of potential, especially given the national goal of 20% renewable energy supply by 2025. In recent years, Taiwan has put more effort into changing policies and developing plans to advance renewable energy development. And this includes President Tsai publicly acknowledging the importance of RE100 and clean energy. SEER and RE100 will also soon be publishing a report on the impact of RE100 for renewable energy development in Taiwan. So keep an eye out for that. So thank you for joining us and please feel free to contact me should you have any questions. Um, feel free to join for the roundtable. And SEER also has a virtual booth at the summit where you can access our contact information at any point during the summit. Okay, let's finally jump into the round table. Um, I'm very honored to be joined by our four speakers that we have with us today. We have, of course, Helen Dewhurst from Bloomberg NEF. We have Laurent, Laurent sorry, Margolov from ING Bank, Leo Wirawan from Google, and Sherman Shear from HeroWrite. Um, also for the purpose of saving time, um, given that we only have 25 minutes and we were allotted an extra 10 minutes, so that's perfect. Um, for each question, we will have our speakers also answer in that order. Um, so now I would like to invite our speakers to introduce themselves and their companies um, in a little more detail, starting off with Helen. I think I've derailed the timing already. Um, I, won't, I won't go too much into what we do because I covered that. But yeah, my name is Helen G. Hurst. Um, I sit on our corporate sustainability team here at BNF in London. Um, and I'm delighted to be here. Thanks. Thank you. And Laurent, would you like to go next? Oh, you're muted, Laurent. Still muted. How about we let's jump to Leo and then hopefully we can sort that out in the meantime. Yeah, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon from Singapore. My name is Leo uh, Wirawan. I'm I lead the uh, energy strategy for Google in uh, Asia Pacific regions, uh, part of the global infrastructure team uh, of, of Google. Um, and yeah, um, I'll stop here. Um, <laughs> That's great. Right, <laughs> thank you. And Sherman? Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Everyone? It's okay? Can you hear my voice? Yes. Yes, okay. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, it's our pleasure to see yes. our green headquarter show in your, your PowerPoint, right? And uh, my name is Sherman, and I'm the executive assistant to our general manager in Air Ori Corporation. Uh, it is always a pleasure to speak among all the change makers. Ori was the first introduced uh, to RE100 concept in 18, uh, 2018. Yeah, so at that time we are already adopting green, uh, clean power at our uh, manufacturing facility by wind and the solar power equipment, providing roughly 20% uh, of our manufacturing energy needs. Furthermore, we announced that that is uh, you. Uh, we were using 100% renewable energy in early 2025. So that is our promise and our keep going. And we, we hope uh, the goal, we can make it. And thank you, Alicia. Thank you. Laurent, are you still having some technical difficulties? Looks like it. <laughs> um, maybe you could try reloading it or refreshing the page. Uh, while we wait for him, I guess I could introduce Laurent for him until he returns. Um, so Lo Laurent is a representative from ING Bank, um, and they are also an RE100 member company. Um, they mostly deal with financing and investing in renewable energy as well as... Oh, Hi, is that now? 
You're back. Yes. Okay. That so, works great. <laughs> Take it away. Okay. Yes. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Sorry about this. Uh, actually, was working fine earlier and then uh, couldn't speak. But <clears throat> yeah. So good. Uh, good evening and and thanks for having us. My name is uh, Laurent Margolov. I'm based in Singapore with uh, ING Bank, and I take of the the coverage of the uh, <coughs> renewable energy, power, and utility sector for for Asia Pacific. So that's include uh, including Taiwan. So um, ING uh, is just um, a Dutch uh, um, a Dutch bank. Uh, we need to show presence with presence in thirteen countries uh, across the region, and we've been in Taiwan since nineteen ninety one, and we've been active in the renewable energy sector in Taiwan since two thousand and fourteen. So it's been quite quite a while. Already. Great, thank you so much, and I'm glad that it's working now. Thank you. Um, so let's jump straight into our first question. So as we all know, Taiwan in recent years has really started to put more effort into renewable energy development with like policy amendments, establishment of T-Rex, etc. So I want to ask our speakers, what changes in renewable electricity, um, whether it's buying, investing, consulting, selling, or otherwise, or Helen, maybe you can speak to the trends of Taiwan, um, have you experienced in Taiwan in the past few years, given these various um, changes? Yeah, well, I think, um, as I emphasized um, in, in what I was showing, um, the, the data that I was showing, there's such a strong demand for this, um, for this clean electricity. And so all it takes is the positive direction in, in the policy in the policy changes and then companies are, are going to seize onto it and if, if you look at how recently these policies um the availability of t-rex has has become available for example um and and how quickly they've been adopted by companies and then also the very short you know relatively the very short time it's taken for the first few ppa announcements to come through um Basically, as soon as it is legally possible, companies will follow, and, and there is the demand is there. It's waiting um, to to take the opportunity. So, I think it's a really good example for other companies, uh, countries that are wondering whether this is all worth it and whether it's too complicated. And um, it, I, I think there's there's a great um, template there for others to follow. Yeah, definitely. I think all eyes are kind of on Taiwan right now, too. Um, so, Laurent, do you have anything to add? Yeah, sure. No, I think that was a, that was a very good introduction and, and the presentation for, from yourself and Ellen earlier. I think I would just say that I think historically, I think what, what worked very well for, for Taiwan is the, I mean, first, the renewable energy targets that the government has set, and they've been very consistent about it. To I think the the, the establishment of a, of a regulatory framework, specifically the the amendment of RADA uh, in early 2019 that allowed the, the direct uh, procurement of power um, through uh, for, for corporate users or energy retailers. I think free, and that's more of a trend. I would say is that. Uh, my view, and, and, and I'm happy to <laughs> to debate that later. But my view is that historically, actually, the 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 end user uh, tariff in Taiwan, especially for corporate, for, for commercial industrial users, were pretty low. Um, and I think to some extent that has uh, sort of slowed down the, the takeoff of corporate PPAs because, uh, you know, at, if you look at a, a tariff of about 2.5 Taiwanese dollar per kilowatt hour, which is, you know, what, what a corporate could buy from Thai Power, and, and you, you compare that for, for a producer with what they could get as a, as a feed in tariff for, for Thai power up to now. Um, that was still a gap. But I think now, you know, where we're going in terms of the reduction in, in renewable energy cost, the, the government of Taiwan also moving very wisely into a renewable energy tender for, for capacity auction. So, but you see that the feet are now overing below that those, 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 uh, those, uh, those grid parity level. So I think that's where, I think that's where you've seen really a takeoff in, 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 in renewable energy, uh, uh, procurement by, by corporate users. So you've seen Google, um, uh, buying power. You've seen, uh, TSMC, obviously, but they've done that before with Vina Energy on a solar plant and now with, uh, with uh, 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 Orsted actually on their uh, upcoming uh, offshore wind farm. And actually what you see is that 
the, the comparison between uh, what what, fit, what the fit would be, say in 2025, 26, when that plan come in, and, and what they could sell to 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 um, to TSMC actually. So it's it's, it's a win win actually for for both parties. I would say. Great, thank you. So that's perfect that you mentioned Google. As we're now bringing it to Leo. Yeah, thanks, Lauren, and thanks, Alicia. Um, um, for us, I mean, if, if we look from the from the global perspective, uh, we first become carbon neutral back in uh, 2007. So we have been a carbon neutral company since 2007. That was that was basically the 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 the, the viable option at that time. So um, we actually did our first PPA in 2010, uh, where, where, where probably corporate PPA not yet uh, not yet famous uh, at that time. Um, and uh, I think we, we, we first set our target in 2012 for 100% renewable energy coverage. Uh, we achieved those in year 2017. Uh, so we have been 100% uh, covered by renewable energy in uh, three years in a row, uh, 17, 18, 19. Um, this year, just, just actually uh, mid-September, we have just announced our newest target. So the it says that we want to have a 24-7 carbon-free energy by 2030. So um, happy to happy to, to chat a bit more with uh, those, but this is a... a, a, a moonshot for us a sustainability moonshots it's a uh, it's a uh, very ambitious uh, we are humbled that uh, this target is, is is not easy beat and uh, there, there, there will be a lot of a lot of challenges along the way now in taiwan itself actually we we, we have been very very happy that i think um you asked what what has been uh, happening in the last few years uh, for us the most memorable was actually uh, at the end of 2018, uh, early 2019, um, where we actually uh, did two things. Number one, we signed the, the, the small PPA of solar, 10 megawatts uh, as a start. But actually, most importantly, we, we actually made an uh, amendment to the Country Electricities Act at that time to, to, uh, to, that enables the, the, the uh, end users to, to actually uh, wield the power directly through Thai power from the developers. So I think this is this is a very good collaboration between between Google, industry stakeholders, suppliers, and also others, uh, but also the Taiwanese government. So we are very grateful for that. So um, we are we are we are the first one who who did that. But more importantly, we are now happy that there are more companies actually uh, capitalizing this PPA because. Um, our vision is basically we imagine the futures where, where it is available for everyone. So I think this is actually a very memorable for us that the, a lot more companies actually uptaking this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leo. Um, and so speaking of companies that are joining um, the commitment to uh, renewable energy, uh, Sherman from Hero Right, would you like to add something about the changes that you've gone through um, since joining RE100? Um, uh, actually, I have to echo all the uh, presentation from our speaker because all uh, all the people say the demand of the clean energy is uh, will be increasing in the uh, past uh, few uh, in the future. Yeah, so we believe that will be uh, that will happen because that like a TSMC portrays a large amount of renewable energy of uh, like uh, offshore the wind uh, power. Uh, Taiwanese company they have made uh, they have uh, they have faced a serious problem a shortage uh, of supply. Yeah, but this is this is not uh, a problem in Taiwan, but also a global challenge. Uh, we think in the next uh, ten years, yeah, the global renewable energy uh, supply and demand gap will uh, will be greater. Yeah, members of the I one hundred. Uh, in 2030, uh, 2030 require a total uh, power, uh, I think it is close to 300 billion uh, kilowatt hour. But uh, with the current plant and new energy production capacity, there's only less than one, one billion kilowatt hour. So they have a big gate 
uh, about uh, over uh, 200 billion kilo, kilowatt hour. So that is a big problem, especially in Taiwan, because we have uh, we have to meet the need uh, in Taiwan. Especially, we see the, the news that uh, TSMC uh, went out all the uh, clean energy. Yeah. So for us, for our small medium enterprises, it's a big challenge for us to. We want to buy a, a, a clean energy, but we need to know where where can we buy all this energy. Yeah. So in fact, we think that it's um, like uh, like uh, another example, like the Apple, uh, the, the Apple iPhone 11 plan uh, last year, they have using 100% renewable energy. Uh, and it is officially announced that about the need of the green, uh, clean power will be much more important in the next few years. So, uh, however, as a bio, we would like to uh, make the supplier uh, have to have they have to I, I mean they uh, they must have the same value as our as our own because uh, they have to care about the environment environmental and the social benefit like we do so we, we won't buy a, a clean power that has to de devastate the environmental condition so so get the clean energy so we uh, we hope we can buy those clean energy from a, a right right way and that is a key concept in sdg like sustainable development in imagination that is our opinion and our hope in the future thanks thank you sherman yeah i think that is a perfect segue into our next question because you're right the the demand is there it's certainly growing um but the concern is how do we get there right now um, so with that said, what are the challenges that you still face? You, we've all come a long way in renewable energy, especially RE100 member companies. Um, and the strength is that we, we have power in numbers, but what challenges do you still face in renewable energy procurement in Taiwan? And if you want to elaborate a little more, maybe what stage of procurement um, has been met with the most barriers? So whether it be um, you know, even just researching what options are best for your company or negotiating with sellers, perhaps as, you know, as Sherman said, a medium consumer versus Google, a large consumer. Um, so, Helen, I don't know if you have more to add. You, you did give us a very informative presentation um, that, if anything, maybe specific to uh, procurement challenges in Taiwan. Yeah, I just have, I have a very quick point actually on that, um, which is that if you look at the unbundled price of T Rex at the moment, um, it's it's really expensive to buy certificates, and and actually, if you're a smaller company, talking about the different scales and the different challenges that um, come with being smaller. Um, than Google, <laughs> um, often the first option that you will look to is um, is certificates, uh, and clean tariffs also a good option. But um, you know, if you are, uh, but, but because there's not as much supply as, as there needs to be at the moment, um, the market's really constrained, and it it, it is a real barrier. If, if, if it's if it's going to be such a significant financial commitment. Um, it's easy administratively, but, but then, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a big decision and it, it might make you think, oh, well, you know, we'll, we'll tackle that market later. We, we won't do Taiwan for now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I think kind of that kind of echoes Sherman's point too, where this is a very long term commitment. Um, and so we'll, uh, but it does need a little more incentive for people to get involved in that commitment, whether that be buyer, seller, any stakeholder. So thank you. Um, Laurent? Yes, thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me. No, I would, I would echo some of what, what has just been said. I think, um, I think a view is that I think so far, actually, when you look at at, at, at PPA, um, I mean, corporate PPA procurement or, or renewable energy procurement, I think it's been largely uh, voluntary. So I think, you, you know, you see company actually subscribing to RE100 or Apple, you know, Apple or Google, and then asking their, their suppliers to actually do the same thing. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, 
for me, I believe that you know, for a market to to properly develop in a, in a large scale, actually, you you probably need to have a bit of, of constraint uh, around that, and I think that's where that's where the government can play another role. I um, you know, in the future, you know, is there, will there be certain constraint on 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 corporate that are heavy users to actually source a, a, a minimum num, a minimum amount of their of their energy needs from renewable energy? Um, I think those type of constraints would be actually very useful to, I think, establish a proper market. You know, if when you're talking about establish a, 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 a RAC market, actually, I think that would be very very useful as well to have a to have to have a, to, to have that constraint actually uh, because I think that's where you go to the next level in terms of um, um, procure, direct procurement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good point. Leo, do you have anything more to add? Yeah, maybe just two things. Number one is probably similar. I think, uh, we believe that the market-based uh, PPA, or, or I mean, uh, as 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 uh, depicted by corporate PPA, is the key to expanding the renewable energy adoption. Right. I think. Uh, especially if, if we can make this a uh, progressively competitive co cost, then this will create a uh, scalability in terms of, uh, in terms of the renewable market-based PPA. And, and I think this is, this is something that, that, uh, uh, I think the, 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 the high prices, for example, a comparison against the fit in tariff, this is, uh, uh, I would say a barriers, uh, in terms of, uh, if, if we think about the wider adoption, if beyond the beyond the beyond the utilities right i mean this is this is i think something that that we hope to be to be to be becoming more prevalent in in taiwan uh for this uh mm -hmm. this is i think this is really the, the 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 major barrier because i think price competitiveness and scalability i think this is the the key words um the second thing i just want to comment a bit i um i think helen's chart uh, the one that a lot of gray than than the than the green the, you know different countries that's interesting uh because i think um if you see uh in a lot of countries and i think taiwan included the default then come into the on-site ppa like like every country mm. practically allow on-site ppa i think helen can 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 can, can comment but i think that you know practically all green right but if you the, the 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 column beside it the offsite ppa i think there's a few greens a lot of grays and a lot of depends right uh, i think there was there was so this is interesting because i think what we believe that offsite ppa actually it's a it's a it's, it's a good vehicle to to do so right i mean so to to go to the default into onsite ppa many of them is rooftop solar where mm. uh, rooftop solar is appropriate for many occasions but also there is a lot of benefit for offsite PPA. So, for example, in terms of the uh, enable the users to purchase substantially greater quantity than the rooftop that that they might have in the. In, in the so I think that's that is good. Um, also, in terms of the flexibility, uh, you know, uh, purchasing over time uh, de depending on the business, how how you expect uh, the business growing and so on, it will allow a lot of this uh, area. So. I think um, what 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 we feel as a challenge is is uh, in Taiwan, but also in others, is is to also increase the the awareness and adoption of the offsite PP. Great, thank you so much, Sherman. I I know you touched yeah. upon your challenges earlier. But is there anything more you'd like to add? Okay, so um, but the, but to be honest, um, I. Uh, we are here already as a small media enterprises, so we may not can uh, give a solid and uh, like a government scale uh, strategy to, to 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 our government. But actually, we can share some experience we we have. Like uh, according to the trend we see, uh, there are more and more enterprises with great resources uh, that choose sustainable practice from our uh, fashion and the beauty industry like for example i mean like uh, uh l'oreal chanel even then uh the, the png and the union labor etc these companies are household names with large resources uh, that smaller brands uh, are hard to relate into but in reality uh, the largest growing uh, market sector uh, come from 
smaller enterprises and brands throughout the world. So uh, when we were approached by IU100, it, it was clear uh, that we were uh, they were looking to bring in SMEs as members. Yeah, I think that is a good with the growth and growth method because uh, uh, to give other smaller and uh, medium enterprises uh, the motivation, yeah, to change. The motivation that adapt to green, uh, like clean, clean energy, clean power practices that and the dismiss the notion that no, only larger uh, companies with great resources that have opportunity to make change. That's not true, but we, we just make it. At all right, we believe a, a philosophy that is uh, everyone can make a change. Yeah, so the society will be changed by each person taking every small step to make a big one. So that is our philosophy, and we want to share to all uh, all the companies, and even though you are small and medium enterprises, uh, you can do and you promise and make a commit. Uh, commitment to the 100% uh, renewable energy use. Yeah, that is uh, why we want to share our experience uh, to, to the, the, the Taiwan lead company or the global company. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly the, like I said before, the strength is in number and in a high demand. Um, so it is very exciting to see more and more companies, regardless of size, commit to uh, renewable energy, despite very much knowing that it is a, a ch challenge and a serious commitment. Um, so that, I guess to, to wrap up, since we're <laughs> very short on time now, um, Sherman also once again kind of led us into a, a great segue point where maybe the rest of you could talk about what changes you would like to see in Taiwan for the advancement of renewable energy in the future? Um, yeah, I think uh, one one idea that I would have is, um, is, is to open up opportunities for the supply chain. Um, so as I mentioned in, in my presentation, there's, there's a lot of pressure that can be, um, good pressure that can be put on um, smaller companies to think about this if they haven't already. Um, and also, um, I, th I think opening up opportunities to collaborate with them and perhaps buy energy um, as part of a group with your with your suppliers. Um, I think that could be a really powerful model given that there are so many um, key cogs in supply chains based in Taiwan. So for example, um, if Google were to sign another deal um, they could be the so-called anchor tenant and um, they could they they could be kind of the main buyer with the, the good credit rating providing banks with certainty for the lending and then there could be smaller portions given out to um some of the other companies to give them the opportunity to to sign on to these deals um leo i don't want to put words in your mouth um i'm, I'm sure you'll be able to say how possible that is um but i i think that would be a really powerful model especially for this market Thank you. And Laurent? Yeah, um, I mean, I think since, since we were just talking about about, about financing and, and since it's, it's really, you know, our core <coughs> business, I would say to, 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 to raise financing or raise capital for this type of, uh, <coughs> of enterprise, I think, yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think the, the, the you know, the, the, um, I think you know to, to be able to raise financing on, on uh, you know so, so a renewable energy generator that has a corporate PPS. I think you know as you need a very strong uh, counterparties, and in fact you know in a lot of countries you had a very strong counterparties in in the state utilities, but now you have to move it to a different type of model. I think you've seen Google actually has been very successful in buying electricity, but you know because of their credit rating, they've also been very successful in allowing actually capital raise on the back of their PPA. I mean, we've seen that, for example, I mean, as far as I'm concerned in, in, in Finland, for example, where we've raised um, a, 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 a financing for, for a wind farm, which is solely on a, on a Google PPA. I mean, now when you look at, you know, a, a scalable market with a lot of different corporates, um, you know, I think it will require a bit more more work. So I think, you know, I like this idea that, that Ellen just mentioned. I think another 
views to take to look at because you know I don't want to, to give to, to take uh, to to, you know, to to give that that give away that that you know it's, it's, it's impossible for SMEs to do that because I think it's possible. I think one approach that we've used you know the part of Asia is actually looking that as a portfolio. So you may have actually a generator that has a portfolio of PPAs. Uh, some of them are high quality, you know, they could be AAA MNCs, they could be state link corporates, but actually a lot of those are actually SMEs. And I think, you know, I think if you look at both equity holders or, or debt holders, actually, I think they will look at the diversification, uh, uh, in the diversification impact as well, right? So you look at a, a big portfolio, if you have a, you know, um, you know, 20% of portfolio that fails, you can still survive uh, uh, because because you have that diversification. So I think, you know, there are many avenues to look at that, but I mean, either way you look at it, you need a lot of scale in the market to, to be able to, to do that because, you know, if you if you want to look at diversification and you have a very large asset, you have 100 megawatt solar or 200 megawatt wind project and, and you want to diversify, obviously you need to be quite a number of parties that are able to connect um, to, to enter into that, that, that PPA. Um, or, or you need to have a big anchor like, like Google, but you know, again, um, that's, that's not, um, yeah. Great, that's thank it. you. And given time, I will let Leo have the last word. Okay, um, I'll, I'll, so I think for us, uh, uh, three, three, three strategies, right? Uh, what, what, what we would like to also uh, see in, 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 in Taiwan. Uh, number one is uh, a lot more uh, different type of commercial structures and and transactions, right? Uh, to to enable this, how how, how can this better uh, uh, benefit all parties? For example, uh, in in Singapore, we recently uh, signed a deal from a rooftop from a public housings and and, and sort of surplus energy mm -hmm. to to put it together, and at the same time integrate into our retailer contract retail contract. So this is uh, make it make it easier for for everybody to do it. So that's one. Number two is around uh, technology. I think we we need a lot more technologies, uh, leveraging a lot of technologies, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Now we can we can deploy this in in, in much more better. For example, wind predictive. Uh, how do we get smarter on that? I think that's 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 uh, uh, what 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 I wish can can be seen in Taiwan. And the third one is around policy. I think uh, a, a great policy is is very crucial. Uh, we hope that the government can have again uh, uh, affordable and scalable uh, uh, renewable energy market in Taiwan in order for the industry to grow. Great, thank you. And thank you to all four of our speakers. A huge thank you. Um, thanks thank you. to everyone joining. And I see that Alyssa is back with us. Yeah, I just popped back in. Uh, thanks, Alicia, for moderating that session, uh, that session. And thanks to all of our speakers here. Um, so that wraps up our side event on the corporate procurement of renewable energy. Um, we have one last side event going on today um, on safety and training uh, with G+. Um, so if you want to, that session's already started about 15 minutes ago, actually, but we'll be going on for the next half an hour. So if you want to head back into the main sessions area and join that session over there, I'll meet you over. And thanks again to all of our speakers uh, on this side event. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Have a nice day.